So once you have convinced that person in that leadership role that it is important to set this time and this space, this meeting, if you will, for listening, how do you help coach that leader to listen as well as do everything else they're doing while they're remaining focused on leading that meeting? That's such a great question. So I go and work in an organization and the leader is dead keen on storytelling. It's a startup. They realize that everyone in the startup needs to be able to tell their story. The startup has grown exponentially to hundreds of people. And I go in to meet this leader. And while I'm talking to her, she's on her cell phone. Then she puts the cell phone down. Then if I brace, then she's on it again. Then another person in the meeting picks up their cell phone. Then there's another person in the meeting who's busy typing on his uh, laptop. Well, it's like, <laughs> here I am <laughs> teaching you about the reciprocal relationship between listening and telling, and you're all multitasking while I'm talking to you. Is this how you operate all the time? Yes, it is how we operate all the time because we feel like time is of the essence. Time is so valuable in this speeded up startup culture that we have to seize on every opportunity to do our work. Well, that's not going to work. And I said to the CEO, are you willing to go into these dedicated times and space for storytelling and not have any of your devices with you? And she agreed. And they then started a formula for how meetings were going to be conducted. So we, as everyone had previously come into the meeting and were working on their laptops making notes, there was now one dedicated note keeper who took notes during the meeting. And there was a revolving thing where one person each time would be chosen to take the notes and circulate them uh, the notes among the people and everyone else had to listen. And each meeting would also start with people going around and saying if there were any current obstacles getting in the way of their ability to listen. So it was a way of identifying those obstacles and releasing them as a way of starting each meeting so that people could just focus on the tasks at hand after that. So the leader had to be willing to put her money where her mouth was. If she doesn't do that, it will not work. So you mentioned in that particular story that there was one dedicated record keeper in that meeting. Do you think that that's the best approach to recording meetings? Because you've mentioned that's important in your book as well. Yes. I think it's really important to have a dedicated note keeper because the dedicated note keeper is also what I would call the dedicated listener, right? So you are relying on the listening of other people when you're speaking in a meeting. And you should know that there's at least one person who's sitting there who is dedicated to absolutely everything that you're saying. My business partner, Jerome DeRoy, is a brilliant note taker. And I know that when I'm having a meeting and we are gathering information to write a proposal, for instance, I know that he's taking every single note that has to be taken and that will be converted into a document that will become our proposal afterwards. So he has learned how to be a dedicated listener. And what that allows me to be is fully present with whoever else is sitting at that table in that moment. When I'm not taking notes, I can be fully present. Now, when a meeting is very, very important, so for instance, when history is being made in an organization, a new decision is being made, or a, a company is pivoting, and there's a meeting to talk about the pivot, then I turn on the recorder as well. Mm. I put on a recording device so you can capture absolutely everything that happened in that meeting.